So Bruce is a San, San Anselmo resident and is on the advisory committee for the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authorities. So that gives him special um, authority to be talking about this measure. He graduated from UC Davis, spent his career as a California State Certified Real Estate Appraiser. He is a past member of the San Rafael School Board, San Rafael Parks and Rec Commission, San Francisco Open Space Commission. You know, there's a whole list of things that he's done, so thank you for all of that community service. And, re you know, most bringing, coming up to date now, he is um, Mark Levine's representative on the Democratic Central Committee. So we'll be hearing from him first. And then we'll hear from Paul Primo, who's a Mill Valley resident. He wrote the no on Proposition AA, which is in your voter manuals that just came out this last week. Um, he earned a chemical engineering master's degree from MIT and worked as a property tax, tax manager for Chevron's US operations. He has been a member of California Taxpayer Association's Executive Committee, and he serves on TAM's Citizen Oversight Committee. In 2012 and 13, he served as foreman pro tem for the Marin County Civil Grand Jury and is a core member of Citizen for Sustainable uh, Pension Plans. So a warm welcome to both of them, and we'll get started with you. Thank you, Susan. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. If you can't hear me, you're not going to miss anything, so it's okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you for having me. Thanks uh, to my friend, Greg Brockbank, for uh, pushing my arm to do this. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, the last time I did this, I uh, hope it will go better today, the last time I did this, we were, <coughs> we were in a hotel, and I was walking down the hall, and as I was walking, I came upon uh, an elderly lady who was shuffling down the hall, and I asked her if I could help her. You know, can I help you? Uh, can I help you? And she said, well, I'm going to the meeting. And I said, well, I'm going to the meeting too. Let me help you. And uh, she said, I hear we have a speaker today. And I said, yes, in fact, I've heard the same thing. And uh, then she says, uh, well, I hear that he's ugly and stupid. Oh. <laughs> so I, I said, yeah, my wife told me the same thing. <laughs> And then she says, and besides that, I hear he's an idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about. So I had to smile and say, yes, I've heard the same thing. <laughs> so we get to the room, and she goes her way, and I go my way. And at the end of the meeting, I'm walking out, and here I run into the same woman. And she looks at me, and she says, well, we were both right. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it will, it will go better today. So... Uh, I'm here, I'm on the advisory committee of the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. Um, I was uh, appointed uh, due to the good graces of Supervisor Charles McGlashan, um, who suggested that I do this because of my background both as a real estate appraiser and as someone who's active in the, in the political world. Since I have uh, been on the, the committee, I've met on a regular basis with my colleagues to uh, give advice uh, to the members of the authority uh, who have now, in the, over the past five or six years, placed Measure AA on, on the ballot. As most of you know, AA is a, a $1 a month parcel tax assessed throughout the nine county region, and uh, it's on your June ballot, and it will need 67% approval to pass. Um, I have passed out some sheets uh, along the table, uh, which if you want some specific information is there. Um, but I would advise uh, all of you, if you ha if you'd like more information on this, to go to the website uh, of the uh, authority, which is sfbayrestore.org. And uh, any questions or information that you would want about the measure and what it does uh, will, will be there. This is this is an incredibly simple ballot measure. It simply says, well, are you willing to tax yourself a dollar a month to pay for the Bay restoration uh, and, and the, all the things that go with it? The, um, the lead sheet on the, on the website will tell you that the uh, purpose of the measure is to provide safe and clean water to prevent pollution 
to restore habitat, to protect, uh, protect us from flood, and to provide shoreline access. It is literally that simple. It's a dollar a month to do those things. Uh, the arguments that are against it uh, are fairly, uh, well, I'll let Paul speak to the arguments against it, but uh, the arguments are fairly simple. Uh, one is it's a regressive tax. Another is that we don't trust regional government. Uh, I'm not adverse to that argument. Uh, and uh, the other is that it lacks transparency. I think Susan's op-ed piece in the IJ was taxation without representation. A well-written article, by the way. Um, I, I would say to you that the idea of it being a regressive tax is true in that it talks about it's a dollar on each parcel. If you, if you don't like taxes in general, or you don't you think this, this sort of regressive tax is a bad idea, then anything that I'm going to say now is probably not going to appeal to you because you're not going to vote for it anyway. If you have a large distrust of regional government, or you think that regional government's a bad idea, all, you won't vote for this anyway because it's just, that's your, that's your position. My own personal opinion is that regional government is not a bad idea. It's been implemented poorly by agencies like the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, but over the course of time, regional government in and of itself is not a bad idea. Look, if we're not interested in working together with people in the Bay Area to solve common problems, then what is it that we're doing? Do you, did, did any of you watch the basketball game last night? Did any of you watch the basketball game? It was a really interesting game. And in the middle of the game, there was an interview with Draymond Green. And the interviewer asked Green about how he played basketball. And his response was, it was a fascinating response. His response was, I would rather give an assist than make a basket. It was, a, it was, a, it was fascinating. Because if you watch the previous series, against the Houston, against the Rockets. The Rockets had one guy who could score, and that was it. And there was no teamwork, and there was no energy there. And so the whole concept of teamwork, to my mind, is what regional government is really about. It's about people working with each other from different parts of life to make things better for all of us. We don't live in a vacuum. The San Francisco Bay is the one thing that we all have in common with each other. And if we're not willing to pay a small amount of money to make the bay healthy, to restore the wetlands, to have all this wonderful things that this project is going to provide, which is why I passed out those sheets to you on the table. There's a list of what the projects are in Marin. If we're not willing to do that and to work collectively with our neighbors, then what is it that we're willing to do? The, uh, I, I think that's really pretty much what I have to say. As, as I said, this is a very, very simple measure. Are you willing to pay a dollar a month to save the bay? Thank you very much. Thanks for the extra time. I'll try not to use it. I don't have any jokes to tell, but uh, I did, uh, when I told my wife I was going to take this position, I took out some more life insurance. Maybe a uh, story. Okay. As Bruce mentioned, I am going to touch on some of the issues that he said. May already have made up your mind. Parcel taxes are innately regressive. If a parcel is in Cloverdale or in Marshall, for example, or Hamilton Bay, that person is going to be taxed the same for this particular proposal as is as are some of the wealthiest companies on the planet. Facebook, Google, Apple. There are efforts to get them these are efforts to get around Prop 13 caps. This one, however, is unprecedented. This particular parcel tax, as Bruce mentioned, is for parcels in nine counties. The most I'm aware of is two counties, which smart parcel tax uh, was issued for. 
and as I mentioned, it protects some of the wealthiest companies on earth. So why aren't local jurisdictions able to or willing to handle these topics that this particular measure is aimed to cover? Are they possibly hampered by inadequate funds? Are they possibly, therefore, hampered by the need to set aside money for retirement benefits, pensions, health care, that sort of thing? Are they being crowded out by the need to put that money aside? San Rafael, for example, you may or may not know, is putting aside 65 cents, or 60 cents, of every dollar that is paid to their employees just for the pensions that those people are entitled to. That's money that could be used for some of these local projects. And as Bruce mentioned, it does create another regional entity, such as ABAG and NTC. And we know how well, and frankly not so well, those agencies have been responsive to the needs of Marin County. The advisory committee that Bruce is on presently has about 33 people. I don't know what it's authorized for. Uh, very few of them have directly relevant technical experience. And there's only one that I know of, member from Marin County, that is on the advisory committee, a senior engineer from uh, a flood control district. Is he here? Yeah. Who is that? Roger Leventhal. Roger Leventhal. Is he here? No. 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 <laughs> he is working. Well, good. <laughs> uh, that the uh, real decisions are made by a seven-member governing board. The, um, the members of that governing board, one must have skill sets that pertain to the Bay and restoration of the Bay. The others are political people who hold elected positions elsewhere around the Bay. The Marin County is represented as one of four Northern Bay counties, Marin, Sonoma, Solano, uh, and Napa. And our representative is a member of the Board of Supervisors from Napa County, uh, Keith Caldwell. Keith's term is up this year and he's not running for the election as supervisor. So we are looking at having perhaps no representative from Marin and certainly more likely, and I'll get to that by in a minute, someone from Sonoma County will be our representative. So it's taxation without representation and it's dilution of responsiveness in favor of Southern Bay this particular measure is to raise $500 million, but it is authorized to raise $1.5 billion. So this is the first, perhaps, of several efforts to regionalize and grow the power of this non-local organization. There is a promise in this particular proposal, in this measure, to give back to each county half of the money that is being raised on the basis of the population in each county. Now, Marin, because we have fewer residents per parcel, will be contributing 5% of the money, about a million a year, but getting back only 3.5% of half of the money. So we're being under returned by about 50%, which means necessarily some other counties are getting back more than they are contributing by parcel. Keep that in mind. To raise money for the election, which was estimated to cost $2 million, three entities contributed with the expectation that if the measure passes, they will get the money back. The Santa Clara Valley Water, uh, what is it called, water? 
water agency or something like that. They contributed a million and a half dollars in return for which, A, they'll get the money back if the measure passes, and if the measure passes, their salt pond restoration will be given priority for grants that would be given from the $500 million. Mm -hmm. The other two entities are the East Bay Regional Parks, which has contributed a quarter of a million, and another quarter million from Sonoma County uh, Water Agency. And again, these folks will be moved to the top of the list for where money will be allocated under this program. Nothing from Marin, not a good deal from Marin. Then there's the issue of labor unions being required to do the work that would be done under this particular proposal. This is something called Project Labor Agreement, which is being considered that would require all the work that is done on any project be done by members of labor unions. So if you're a volunteer organization, uh, you must either somehow get the paperwork done to be beyond that requirement or not be eligible to participate in these particular projects. There is a Citizens Oversight Committee that will have only one, I'm sorry, will have several people who have functional scientific and engineering skills to review the adequacy and the, the validity of the projects and the, and the scope of work that we've done. There is no one on the Citizens Oversight Committee to represent taxpayers who are fronting the money for these endeavors. I'm a member of a Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, in fact, I'm a taxpayer representative on the Transportation Authority of Marine. Susan mentioned that in the intro. And that's an essential role to protect the people whose money is being spent. Uh, there will be audits done, presumably, and uh, the citizenry needs to have an, a voice and an opportunity to ensure that the goals that are specified are adhered to. Now, as to the goals and the administration of this entity, um, David Lewis, last week, at the League of Women Voters uh, presentation, made a point that there is no staff for this particular entity. Well, I don't know how that works. You're going to be managing half a billion dollars, and um, one of the selling points is that you don't have any overhead. Well, of course you're going to have overhead. So these are some of the details that have yet to be made available, and yet you are voting on it, perhaps by mail, within just a few days. Uh, well, one of the uh, questions I would have as an analyst is, how are the projects going to be sequenced, prioritized, measured, what parameters will be used, how will they be weighted, None of this detail is provided. So for these kinds of unclear, unspecified, omitted, and maybe misleading uh, omissions of this particular measure, I'm going to vote no, and I would urge you also to vote no for Marin County. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start over here at uh, table three. Uh, if anyone has a question here. If not, okay, we have uh, one. Yes, thank you for your presentations. Um, I wrote a uh, Marine Voice submission last week to the IJ. They haven't published it yet. I'm hoping they will. But the title of my article was Send Measure AA Back to the Drawing Boards because I think it does have many serious flaws. 
And what I meant by drawing boards was taking it back to the state legislature and having them make certain corrections in the whole process and then resubmitting it to the voters at some point where it's a healthier and stronger uh, process, politically speaking. And the main, the main correction I wanted to see was that each of the nine counties would have the right to elect their own individual representative, for, for example, for a term of four years instead of uh, open-ended. And we would have the right ongoing to vote in and vote out anybody that we chose to. And we would be uh, represented that way with a direct connection uh, to the candidate. So my real question to the panelists are, is it possible to send this back to the legislature and have them redo some of these basic flaws, uh, which are flaws in my opinion? Well, is it possible? In politics, anything is possible. Just ask your colleague there at the table. Uh, I, think, I think the reality of life is what's going to happen. Franklin, did anybody hear his question? Okay, so I think what's going to happen is that uh, the measure will be voted on. If it passes, then it's done. And if it doesn't pass, it likely will go back to the drawing board. Most of you know that um, Assemblyman Levine has introduced a bill, AB 24, to restructure, to basically do away with the MTC as it's currently set up, and to make it elective as you just talked about. Personally, I happen to support that concept. I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, and, the, and if Measure A8 does not pass next month, uh, I'd be amenable to suggesting to Assemblyman Levine that maybe as his bill works his way through the legislature that he could amend it to include something along the lines that you speak of. That makes sense. I, I think that's a great answer. There's nothing I could add to that. Okay, Helen. Uh, my question is, if you look at the sheet that uh, was passed around with the uh, wetlands listed on it, you'll see that uh, several of those have been uh, sponsored by Marin Audubon Society. And Marin is very ahead of the game in wetland restoration. And uh, the last speaker's uh, comment that these entities will not, these non-profit entities will be shut out uh, in the process where they have great experience. You know, uh, if you're up with wetlands, you'll know that there's some good ones all added along our bay. And these people are going to be shut out to uh, let the uh, unions deal with it, and they're not going to use this experience. Well, can I just, let me respond to that they're getting a shot. I agree. That's my position. The, unfortunately, what, what was passed out was as best, as best as I could do by reducing what was on the website. But if you look at the website, do, do all of you have this sheet with the map on it? I know it, I didn't pass out enough of them, but if you could just take a look at it. The map is there, and then on the flip side is actually this list, which is the list of projects. And what's cut off at the top, unfortunately, is the project name, the county that it's in, the project description, and then the last the last column, the column on the right, that's the lead organization. So, in fact, what we're going to be doing is to be giving grants to agencies like those that are listed. So these agencies that are here, they are the lead agencies that will be doing the work. So it's, a, it's essentially a grant process that goes to, for instance, in the wetlands restoration, it goes to the Audubon Society to do the wetlands restoration part. Um, and unfortunately, it's my fault because I cut off the top. The organizations that are in that column there, they're the lead organizations that would, that would be responsible for the project that's there. And I'm just, that should, I should have said that to start with. Yeah, here's, was that a, here's the what I mean? Partially, but going forward. Um, I think one of the questions that she was asking is, is there going to be, and, and what would be the mechanism by which voluntary organizations that are not union organizations would be able to uh, bring their uh, skill and their energy to this, to the uh, purpose of this, uh, and is there going to be uh, some bureaucratic blocking going on? Yeah. So the answer is, I love the, I, the, the bureaucratic. Yes. So the it, the organization that actually runs the this program currently is the California Coastal Conservancy. It's not MTC, it's not ABEC. 
is the California Coastal Conservancy. And if you're familiar with that organization, it's a terrific group of folks who are dedicated to basically redoing the environment and making it better along the coast and along the waterways. So the conservancy is where the grant process would go. So you apply to the conservancy for a grant, they give you the grant to do whatever the whatever the work is that's here on, on the page. It's essentially a grant process. Yes, but we would have now the other speakers. Well, let me just mention something here. Uh, it's kind of interesting that this particular element, this project labor agreement, was in, introduced back as well, Resolution 11. It was introduced back in January to be voted on by the entity. And uh, reports are that this was to encourage the support of labor unions in the vote. Well, the particular document has been tabled for a while pending further discussions with Audubon and Ducks Unlimited. So there's like obviously an issue here, and they are not going to accept and vote on the resolution until the end of June, which tellingly is after the election will take place. So I think it's a big issue, and uh, the devil is in the details here as well. I noticed that the uh, flood control district flood control district is involved in many of these uh, projects and we know what the flood control district has done up to now. <coughs> Everyone heard that? <laughs> About the flood control district? That's me. I live in Ross Valley. I'm not defending that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> because wetlands restoration actually increases flood risks because you're removing levees in order to let the tidal flow in, and because the greatest need for that 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 restoration is in the South Bay, why should eight counties pay for Santa Clara County's flood protection? Okay. Yeah. So, so that's a fair question. Uh, I guess, it, I guess the answer to it would speak to sort of your philosophy of life, which is: Are you interested in cooperating with your neighbors to make the things better as a whole? Um, I, I was, you know, I'm 68. My wife is 70. We continue to pay school parcel taxes. And the reason we continue to pay school parcel taxes is because long after I am dead and in the ground, my children and grandchildren will continue to be going to schools in Marin County. And I want to make sure that the schools that they go to are good. I have no personal vested interest in that, but I think it's a good idea. Similarly, not, not when I'm dead and in the ground. <laughs> That's, that's right. And so when you restore wetlands and when you restore the bay, you're doing this for people who live throughout the Bay Area. Not necessarily for ourselves, but for people who will come after us. Where's, where's Carol? Um, I think we should balance this a little bit here, sure. uh, back and forth, yeah, I, I, time wise. Just go back to the example of the salt pond. You fly into SFO, you know where the problem is. Uh, in the South Bay. That's where the money is. That's where the people are. Why should we, you, in, in, if, if your your family is going to benefit from education that you're funding before they even use it, there's some logical nexus there. I see no nexus for people, let's say, in Cloverdale or Marshall or Inverness or here, having to pony up money, how trivial it may be, it's the concept that's important, to take care of the potentially damaged flood flood control sea level rise issues of high tech entities down in Santa Clara County. So I support your point. The answer is no. They should not be looking to us to fund their needs. Okay, another question here. Uh, reading the voters manual there's some reference to payment of bond issue. Are you allowed to issue a bond? It's a very vague reference, but it's a small paragraph in there. It's in there. I, I, I have no idea. I, I, it's a fine point that I don't know the answer to. I just don't. I think it's included in the $1.5 billion authority that's provided. And, and uh, 
that monies could be paid until as late as 2049 on such obligations should they be entered into with a 20-year term. So I think the answer is yes. So there's a binding authority that's provided and not yet exercised. Uh, I'm 84, I've lived here for 35 years, and I've lived in Canada, England, France as well. Um, I think the creepiest thing in all of this is the question, do we trust local government? Uh, let's be realistic, we're in the finest possible place you could possibly be. People do trust each other, they're nice, this is the, the greatest place I have ever lived. And I think, of course, we trust local government. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but do we trust regional, regional government? <laughs> yes! Uh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, uh, Paul made the point that <coughs> each of us will be in the personal tax, but big uh, business, if they had only one piece of real estate, would be paying the same. Bruce, could you, you didn't speak to that before. Could you speak to the legalities of the differential nature of parcel taxes in, in our school district, we are no longer allowed to tax commercial property differently right. from residential. Right, correct. So <clears throat> when we were talking about how we were going to proceed with this ballot measure, we looked at several different alternatives. Uh, parcel taxes came up as the best alternative. You, you can't you cannot tax people on assessed value because of Prop 13. It's just, it's um, not impractical, but it is impractical. Prop 13 doesn't work as a, as a way to, to come up with this. The other way to do it is to add and put on a quarter cent sales tax or a half cent sales tax like they did with SMART. That was an alternative that we rejected. We thought the parcel, a small parcel tax was a good idea. Uh, and it was the best way to go. The argument that, um, you know, people, some people who have the ability to pay are um, not paying their fair share is an interesting argument. Um, I happen to know that in the South Bay, uh, large companies like Google and uh, Apple are working with uh, the Sierra Club and other, uh, other Save the Bay type organizations. And, uh, I think the Audubon Society, as I think about it, and those those uh, companies are making substantial and very large contributions currently to uh, projects that obviously are in their self-interest to to help um, you know do save the bay sorts of projects. Uh, would um, the other speaker yeah, like to address? Well, this well I, I, I'd say you know, that's exactly right. It's in their self-interest. They owe it to their shareholders. They owe it to their employees for, to democratize this somehow or, or socialize it, as the parcel tax measure would do, uh, is not only unfair, it's inappropriate for uh, companies with the assets that they have. Okay. Thank you, Clayton. 30,000 red residents currently <coughs> live within the 100-year flood zone along the Bay Shore. Their flooding rates will rise intolerably over the next few years. Thousands of marine jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars of business inventories are at risk. Those of us who don't live in the maritime flood zones depend on infrastructure, services, and jobs at risk from flooding. Our wastewater treatment plants, roads, smart, will be inundated by a 100-year flood event. We also use the bay for recreation, and its environmental health is a key part of our quality of life. Currently, at-risk residents, local governments, and businesses can't afford to solve the problem alone. Formation of special districts won't be sufficient. Funds will need to come from a number of sources. Our team is prepared to compete for Proposition AA grants. We intend to combine these with other funds to implement resilient shore projects should the proposition pass. The challenge is great, and we need to start now. Mr. Primo, if not AA, how do you propose to come up with the money our community need, our communities need now to respond to this eminent threat? I think you just said how it is going to be. Uh, you're, you're going to come up with seed money yourself, right? It's not exclusively 
through partial taxes. That's and I don't know your, what, what is your association? Uh, our group is called Resilient Shore. Do you uh, require the partial tax to pursue and succeed in the efforts that you're making? It will probably take funds from many sources. That's what it should be. I don't and know why. This, and this would be one of them that we would compete against others to try to, uh, to uh, get grants, and we're prepared to compete against others. My issue is the equity of this. That you mentioned the recipients and who they would be, and you're looking at a broad brush of contributors from all over the various counties in our twelve. So, the benefits all. so look closer. Yeah, before we turn this into a dialogue, would you have a comment on this? <clears throat> the only comment that I have is that, is that, to my mind, it would be important uh, when this passes to uh, ask this man over here, Supervisor Connolly, that when Keith Caldwell retires from the Restoration Authority, that perhaps Supervisor Connolly could join that board and be the voice of Marin that Charles McGlashan used to be on that board. I think having one of our own uh, as a member of the authority would be immensely helpful to speaking to making sure that we do get our fair share of funds. Okay. I would just mention that uh, Sonoma County is going to be at the top of the list for project recipients because of the quarter million they're putting in. And this smacks of special interests mm -hmm. and favors, I would remind you. Okay, uh, well, let's uh, move around here. Here we go. Thank you. I'm uh, no expert in this measure, although my wife, Esther Wanning, did write an op-ed in response to Susan's in favor of the measure. But um, as to the issue of taxation without representation, I just want everyone to be aware that this is how representative democracy works. We can't possibly elect a specific members to specific bodies to oversee every issue. Often elected officials, particularly city council members and, and county supervisors, uh, represent many organizations on many issues, many of which are joint powers authorities, as this one is. In fact, Marin is the uh, queen of uh, joint powers authorities. I think there's uh, nearly two dozen of them, and I'm sure there are many dozens of others around the Bay Area as well. So to say it's taxation without representation, when I think there's a pretty good balance uh, between the half of the money which will go pro rata to the various segments of the bay, north, or south, east. Yeah, I think yeah. I mentioned if you the, could respond to that. I mentioned the arithmetic problem with that. Marin, none of these people on the governing board are elected to the governing board. So who are they responsive to? Their own constituents. I, I, I didn't but no, no, not in this capacity. Well, as I say, you can't elect everybody to everything. The only directly elected it's body... It's only a half a billion bucks, or one and a half when they're through. The BART board is the only example I can think of that has directly elected members, and I don't know that that's some great paragon of local government or regional government. So I'm not sure that directly elected I, members are better. I, I, I guess we, like to we hold, agree to disagree. Okay. I, um, in, in this, I know we have a, a lot of passions here, uh, but this is not going to be a dialogue. Uh, just questions, really, if we could, uh, David. What I'm hearing and what I've been reading about this is very similar to the questions about Measure B for the College of Marin. The president of the College of Marin said in an uh, IJ the other morning that we don't have a master plan yet, but we're working on it. I'm hearing we don't have the details yet, but these are some ideas that we want to put together. Give us the money. We'll make sure it works. And the question, David. And there'll be no review possible. And the question is, David, I think it sounds like, you have. I would like to ask, do you see this as a viable project that the money invested can be returned, if not once, several times, to the people that are making the investment? And I don't mean just the pay-to-play people like the unions and like the counties, but I mean the residents. A fair, a fair question. So what I would do, in the early 1970s, I went to work for the president of the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. And in the second year that I was there, we dreamed up this idea of creating an open space fund in San Francisco. At the time, it was known as Measure J. 
it's morphed into something else, but basically it's, it's uh, an open space fund. That fund has been in existence in San Francisco for well over 40 years, and I know for a fact that the money that's been raised from that fund has gone 100% to restoring parks, building parks, building open spaces in San Francisco. And what it's done is for the people of San Francisco, they've made an investment in their future to make sure that in an urban environment like this San Francisco, there's open spaces that people can use. This is exactly what's going to happen with Measure AA. It's a simple $1 a month effort, and it's going to raise $500 million over 20 years. And if you know anything about funding, especially uh, government funding, it's sort of a drop in the bucket uh, in, in my mind, because it's $25 million a year, which will probably not go all that far. But what it will do is it'll give it will set us down the road on the first step to trying to clean up the bay. And again, as I said before, it may not be for us, but it will certainly be for our children and our grandchildren. You know, I used to live in Glenwood, and that's why Carol Brandt probably remembers this. I've been in Glenwood when I can't get that off out of San Pedro Road because a combination of storm surge and tide has made the water come over San Pedro Road. And if, and if you know, I'm in the real, I'm real estate appraisal business, if you come to me and say, I want to buy a home in Glenwood right along uh, Point San Pedro Road, I tell you, you can enjoy it for 10 years, but in 50 years, that road may be underwater. The sea level's rising, the bay is going to rise, and if we don't do something now to take the first step to make the bay better and to make it healthy and to restore things, then we're not doing the job that we, you know, that we're obligated to do for our, the people who come after us. Uh, Paul, would you like to weigh in on this? I, I would only say that again, the, the benefit that accrues is not necessarily being accruing to the people that are paying for the benefit to be accrued here. In other words, if, if there are issues in the Bay, and I know there are, the people that are affected by the issues in the Bay and the volunteer organizations like Save the Bay that are already doing a commendable job are the sources of the money that should be used for that purpose, not the taxpayers. And additionally, this approach just kind of is sort of like the camel's nose in the tent. If there are worthy causes around nine counties or eight counties or whichever module you want to select that ought to be handled by a parcel tax through this mechanism, get ready for it because if this passes, it will be the mother of those kinds of exactions, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. So it's my understanding that we live in the Bay Area. It's a nine county region that in California is the eighth largest economy in the world. The Bay Area is a significant contributor to that. The effectiveness of all of us throughout the Bay Area to get to work, for industries to do what they do, for the ports to operate, for everything that, that makes it so people in Marin County have jobs as well as everywhere else, um, depends upon all the functioning of the Bay as a system. So we have a parcel tax measure that, that <coughs> provides wetlands restoration and flood protection. So if we're providing flood protection to the South Bay or to Marin County, which needs it, or to the East Bay, and that keeps the regional economy functioning, why is that bad? And how do people in Marin not benefit from that investment? Why shouldn't it be paid for by a better mechanism than imposing a uniform parcel tax on the relatively small parcels, large corporations? Where, where does this stop is my question. We arguably we benefit from a lot of things geographically for our livelihood and so forth. Should we have parcel taxes to pay for, for example? How about the third lane on the uh, bridge? Wouldn't that be nice? Explain would would the, the people from what Santa Clara choices? County I, like I, to I, be, I, I, pay I, for that? What are our choices to pay? Describe to me all the types of payment choices we have and the pros and cons of parcel tax versus a sales tax. So you're, you're concerned about parcel tax. How is something else better or worse? I'm not sure I would accept it given that there is a need outside of present mechanisms to take care of the problems that are identified. Well, that's oh, okay, okay, we're, we're done. done here. And would you like to respond? No, probably not. Okay, <laughs> <And> Robin. <laughs> Can each of you explain why it is that these funds could be provided by the general fund of the state legislature? I, I think I mentioned that because of, for example, the, we have the crowding out in local government for pensions and so forth. 
The state legislature has a surplus coming. That's a good point. But until recently, uh, the state legislature has not had money for such purposes. I think it'd be a great uh, alternative. What's wrong with that? It's because arguably, it's not just the nine counties that benefit from the bay. It's a tourist attraction around the world. Uh, maybe we should look to larger government entities for that. I like it. I think it would be a, good, a much better solution than this. But a carbon tax. Robin, I'm not sure that there's a good answer. In politics, you know, funds are appropriated based on who chairs the Appropriations Committee. That, that would be a helpful thing to have. Uh, to say that uh, we should take the money from somewhere else because the state has a surplus uh, is an interesting argument. Uh, but in times that are bad, there's not going to be a surplus. What this measure does is simply one thing, and I'll reiterate it, reiterate it again. It provides for a dollar a month, a set aside time to start bay restoration. It, you know, if you don't like special funds or if you don't like, you know, regressive taxes, this is not something you're for. To my mind, unless you're willing to put money aside for specific things like bay restoration or the smart train or for infrastructure, then when all of us are in the ground, our children will turn to us and say. What were they thinking? Why didn't they take care of this and look ahead to the Okay, future? let's go on to one more. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, on the Cordovadera Flood Board, and Cordovadera has a complex infrastructure to prevent uh, flooding, and we've been successful uh, in preventing the flooding that we saw in 83. Uh, but one of the concerns I have is the uh, rather extensive wetlands that have been restored but are being lost uh, due to uh, storm surges and ferry wakes. And I've been looking for ways to find funds to, to deal with these outer wetlands that really do help provide some protection by blunting some of the storm surge. But I haven't been able to find it. And where would I look? I'm looking to measure AA to help with that. That, that would be a place to do it. Is there uh, one of the questions I think is, is he saying, uh, are mechanisms for applications for funding from this pool of money uh, in a part of in place in the legislation? Or are they not yet arrived at? Yeah, no, that's not how that's not how things work. The way things work is you pass the measure, and this is one of Paul's criticisms. The way it works is you pass the measures, and then you get the regulations in place to to start the process. The California Coastal Conservancy, and I, again, advise if you haven't done so, to go on their website and take a look at it. The California Coastal Conservancy, which operates the, the authority at the moment, they have a system that's in place for making project grants. It's already in place. If you look at their website, you see how they currently make their grants. So what your suggestion is, is that the uh non-administration that I guess there's no administration there's no uh, people in charge of the money well there isn't people in charge of money it's the restoration authority the, the restoration authority turns to the Cal this organization and models on um, their model yeah. there's, so there's no protocols in place for this mm -hmm. mechanism to function yet we're supposed to vote for it and trust them and then they will come up with the protocols the priorities the weightings of projects such as this gentleman mentioned. Uh, we don't know how it's going to work. Okay. Now we have another. It doesn't question. mean it won't work, but it doesn't mean it will either. Sure. It seems like what we've been discussing kind of what kind of boils down to the three separate issues. Oh, sorry. It seems like it kind of goes into three issues. One is flood protection, which I think we're all interested in. One is wildlife and weapons restoration, which maybe not all of us are interested in. And the third one is who pays for what and who benefits from it. So everything kind of, in my mind, fits into those three categories. <coughs> if you accept that. Sorry, microphone near mouth. Oh, <laughs> microphone near mouth. <coughs> if you accept that notion, and incidentally, something to follow, and then we put this on the side, is if we don't do flood protection, then we're going to have sea level rise, and we're going to have insurance increases. 
which we'll have to pay for, why couldn't we take some of that money, just dealing with that one subject, and form assessment districts? Assessment districts would be local, assessment districts would be governed locally, addressing separately those three, three different issues, that of flood protection, wildlife, and who pays for what. So we all get to solve it, still solve it, but do it in something that we can control, not just a billion and a half dollars for somebody question. else. My question is, why isn't that a good idea? I, I think it's a good, I, good alternative, benefit assessment districts. I, I can't defend why they aren't there. Why weren't they considered? Do you know, Bruce? I don't know, but I can tell you my personal opposition of benefit assessment districts that it, is that it, it's self-interested that benefits a specific group of people. So let's say, for example, that you live in, you live where I live. Let's say you live in San Anselmo. You're not near the bay. But I want to go take my dog for a walk in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which I may or may not be able to do anymore. I don't, I don't it's very, probably a bad example. But, uh, I haven't paid for that. If it's a benefit assessment district that's been fixed because of, it's assessed the local people, I haven't paid for that, but I'm using it. That's not fair. And it's the same thing with Measure AA. The reality of life is that people who live in places like, I don't know, Pickett, Ross, or, or San Salvo, or well, Belvedere's Bayfront, but people who don't live on the bay, they're not going to have direct benefit from this parcel tax because they're not living on the bay. But when they want to take their kids to go to the park or to the beach, or they don't want you know, to have roads flooded, which they want to drive across, having Measure AA in place is going to be a guarantee to them that things will work. And again, I just I go back to the same refrain. Yeah, we have an obligation. Let me finish. Right let me, OK, let me finish. We have an obligation to people who come after us to fix the bay, because if we don't, we're making a big mistake. Okay, Sorry. Paul, would you... Uh, all, all I would say is this may not be the right way to do it. That's mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, coming today. So I want to give each of you a chance to give like a one or two minute wrap-up statement. And, you know, we'll go in the same order since you started. You can go first to do, if you'd like to do that. You can pass if you want to. But just to give a summary statement. And maybe before, while you're thinking about your closing comments, just in terms of this audience, at the beginning I asked, you know, who was in favor, who was opposed, who was undecided. Let's see with a show of hands. How many of you have had your mind changed as a result of this presentation? Okay, a few. How many of, those of you who were undecided now have an opinion? And how many of those of you who have an opinion who didn't before? Okay, so let's just do the whole thing up. How many of you, if you were voting today, now, would be voting in favor of Measure AA? Show of hands. And how many of you would be voting against it? So, okay, still pretty, pretty balanced. So you get to close, make your closing comments on that. And so, to you, Bruce. Well, I, I don't have any closing comments. I just want to thank Susan and the group for allowing me to come and speak. Um, we don't do enough of this in a democracy, and you'll be seeing that in the coming six or seven months. We don't stand next to each other and talk about issues that are important to each other. So the fact that all of you take your lunch hour to come and listen to this presentation and the other things that the coalition does, it, it's a wonderful thing. I just thank you for coming. I agree. <laughs> That's what was just said. And uh, appreciate your attention. I know, I believe these are closely held opinions and feelings about these issues. I don't know that we can change you, your opinions in any way. Maybe we did. Mainly, this is a forum to provide some facts and information. And thanks for the, to the coalition for giving us the opportunity to exchange some views with you and for your input as well. Thank you.